recorded live from the secret underground lair of Crimson Cowl Comics and Collectibles, this is the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. The following issues may contain spoilers. When there's something strange in the neighborhood, who are you going to telephone? I'm Anthony. I'm Kirby. And I'm Katie. Welcome to issue number 296 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. Every time we record, we talk about comic books. We don't have a club discussion on this show, but to give you a little preview of what's to come, we have, I think as of this week, we have the issues of uh, Once Upon a Time at the End of the World, number 13, that came out. And in the previews, we see number 15 is uh, available to pre-order, and it says final issue. So we do know that it is officially 15 issues. Um, and then uh, we have the April special, which I believe came out this week as well. So uh, we will do those in future episodes once we assemble everybody who wants to talk about them. Uh, but on this week's show, we're going to do weekly reviews. That's where we go back and forth and we talk about the books that we've been reading, whether they're new, whether they're old, we're going to talk about them there. And then we have part two of two of our previews preview. If you check back to our previous episode, you will see part one, which we covered the Marvel and DC catalogs for products coming out in May 2024 and beyond. Uh, this week, we're going to cover the independent catalog, uh, the giant catalog with the independent publishers and the apparel, the merchandise, the collectibles, all of that fun stuff. And kind of talking about what we're excited for to pre-order at our local comic shop, or preferred online retailer. So that is going to be the lineup for the show. Let's kick it off with the weekly reviews. First up for the weekly reviews, I wanted to dip into my back issue catalog, specifically to the late 80s, uh, from something from my original comic book collection growing up, because at the week of this recording, we have a brand new Ghostbusters movie that is out in theater, and I was all hyped to uh, revisit some Ghostbusters in comic book form. I've talked about things in the past, but I wanted to go all the way to the past. And I'm talking about the real Ghostbusters, issue number nine. This is the official comic adaptation of the popular 1980s cartoon series, inspired in turn by the hit movies. The Ghostbusters rescue a young boy from a ritual sacrifice, only to be pursued by the dark forces that will take over New York City to get him back. This comic is done by James Van Hise, John Tobias, Rich Rankin, Dan McKinnon, Barry Peterson, and cover art by Gary Fields. So if you're checking out this video section, I am holding a real Ghostbusters comic book while wearing a Ghostbusters shirt, while drinking from a Slimer cup, all while I'm in the New York uh, City Public Library, and there is uh, a librarian ghost behind me, so... Um, as we remember from the original movie, she wanted to kind of keep it quiet, but this is a podcast, so I'm going to have to speak a little louder. Uh, hopefully this ghost right over here does not turn around. Um, and nobody, and I have to say this part quiet, nobody say the secret phrase, which is get her. Nobody say get her. So that, that's going to, that's going to activate her. So here we go. This is the real Ghostbusters number nine. Um, what was cool about my childhood collection well, it's cool in a way that uh, it, to talk about it now, but I never had a lot of consecutive issues. So I just had, you know, whatever I could find, mostly at rummage sales and maybe I'd get something at uh, the pharmacy or something like that. But um, so this was the random issue that I pulled out to talk about. This is part one of three. So I'm going to now have to track down the other ones here and a uh, story that's been lingering for, you know, almost 40 years. Uh, this is called the Father Thing Trilogy. And uh, this story is about the Ghostbusters uh, answering a call and going out into the woods because they see that there's a ritual sacrifice that is going on. And there's some uh, some some demons, some witches, and a lot of uh, shadiness going on. And our Ghostbuster team uh, runs out there and they see that a young boy is being sacrificed. And they save the boy. And as they uh, realize that um, he's going to need some medical attention... Uh, they eventually end up 
taken him back to the firehouse as they try to investigate uh, the estate in which his family had lived in. And we find out a history about his uh, mother being a witch and the fact that he is being uh, a ritual sacrifice to basically invite this uh, this this god, this demon god on, into Earth to do a bunch of bad stuff and kind of take over Earth or kind of, you know, combine the worlds and basically a lot of big evil world apocalyptic type stuff. And it's all kind of uh, lying on the shoulders of this young boy who who is uh, basically an orphan. Uh, the Ghostbusters uh, bring him in to kind of watch over. We have um, we got one creature or one guy, this uh, warlock. This is me testing my virtual screen. I'll do this. There's one warlock uh, guy right here that is uh, kind of disappearing and reappearing as he shows up and he's trying to lure this boy. He, he's trying to get the boy to basically submit to this um, this prophecy, this uh, birthright type of thing. And meanwhile, the Ghostbusters are doing some research. They're trying to figure out what's going on. There's a fun little moment where uh, I noticed here that Janine, uh, the Ghostbuster secretary, is, um, and uh, yep, this is going to be, here we go. The Ghostbuster secretary, they're sitting there in the, like, the, the kitchen area, and I noticed a box of Ghostbuster cereal that they're eating from, and I just think it's cool that the Ghostbusters are uh, eating their own branded cereal. <laughs> that was just a funny little note that I uh, picked up there, and uh, um, what's cool about the real Ghostbusters, you know, based off of the cartoon, um, kind of set up with the characters and the designs that Slimer is part of the team. I do have uh, Slimer uh, with me here today. Um, here's Slimer hanging out with us. You may see him disappear. Uh, whoop, there he goes. He's gone. Look at this. I'm going to have too much fun with this. Um, Slimer is part of the team. He's basically their mascot, and that's what I kind of loved about the real Ghostbusters, and I was revisiting some of those cartoons, and it's just cool to see that, you know, while he doesn't do, uh, you know, I don't think he does any harm to them in the movies or anything, you know, it's just kind of, he's just eating food and driving buses and stuff like that, so ultimately, while he may have a scary uh, presence and, you know, as they approach him and stuff like that, you know, he's he's not threatened to end the world or anything like that, so when they did the cartoon and then the comic book, um, it was kind of cool to see him just be one of the team members and everything, so that, that is just one of the beauties of this. Um, after reading this story, this is part one of three. I need to go and seek out the other ones, but these comics are out of print. The trade paperback omnibuses are out of print. They're super expensive. I think there's a copy online for volume one for like 900 bucks. So, um, we'll see if I can, <laughs> yep. I knew Katie, uh, who is, uh, experienced, you know, Star Wars, you know, uh, paperbacks being out of print and all that stuff. You know, there's a couple cheaper copies on eBay that aren't $900, but, um it's one of those things i gotta see if it's on comiXology or something because i do want to go through and it'd be fun i think there's maybe like 30 some issues total that they did in this initial run but it was fun to revisit something that i haven't read since i was uh you know maybe five six or seven or so when i was getting into ghostbusters so it was cool to revisit that specifically for this week so that is the real ghostbusters number nine that's a, a teaser setup for this three-part trilogy right there so that's my first review there. We're going to kick it off to Kirby. Oh, wait. That's right. I want to show off the back here. So they have this ad here for uh, Speed Racer. And the person that owned it prior to me had color in uh, the teeth of, I think he's like what the, like the, 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 the coach or the team, the, the race manager, whatever that guy's name would be. But he colored in the teeth there. So it's one of those things that uh, I had wondered if that was my doing. But there is, and I won't show this in, uh, because the information's here and I don't want to dox anybody, but there's somebody named Patrick that filled out a subscribe list to subscribe to comics from Now Comics, and they also wrote in blue pen. So I'm going to say that it wasn't me that literally defaced uh, this comic book. <laughs> All right, that's it from our review. Uh, kick it off to Kirby, what you got for us? I didn't know those were that expensive because I got some of the single issues that I'm going to have to dig yeah. out now so they don't get ruined but yeah, i know i have a few of them so cool, cool all right i am reviewing takio by brian michael bendis and michael omen uh this is 
a really fun book if you're into the younger character characters gaining superpowers. But we got Taki and Olivia are sisters in an adoptive family, and they're driving each other crazy. Every day, their overprotective mother makes them walk to school together, eat lunch together, and play together. They can't get away from each other. But when a secret experiment goes catastrophically wrong, the squabbling siblings suddenly find that they have superpowers. They're the first actual superheroes in the entire world. And it is awesome. But are the girls ready to face the daunting challenges posed by their amazing new abilities? And is the rest of the world ready for real life superheroes? Find out in this complete collection of Takio. And yeah, it says Brian, Michael in there for doing this. This is really enjoyable if you're into characters getting their new superpowers and stuff, these being the first superheroes. Basically, they're in a laboratory of their friend's dad's a scientist type character, and he's messing around with stuff, and the laboratory blows up. When it blows up, this blue ability just gets launched into the air, and the girls end up getting powers from it. And they're able to use their powers. It's kind of like this blue electric aura type thing comes out of their hand or body parts whenever they're throwing a fist or trying to stop something coming at them it'll sit there and like blow out and damage the thing or if they get attacked by someone and they're mad at them they can just get angry and burst a big shell like a blue energy type shell around them that affects everybody that is near them uh they can not quite fly but they can jump really far they're kind of i mean these are all abilities they're just first learning they kind of like go a step too far instead of doing some training and learning about their superpowers like everybody and it's like i got some special powers i'm gonna go fight crime well (laughs) your first time you go fight crime you don't know about your powers you don't know if they're gonna work or not or how they're gonna work or what's gonna happen so the girls try and figure that out but they eventually learn a few things of their stuff but they really never in this book at least sit down and learn their complete abilities or anything like that so there's this could go a wide range of ways in the future if they ever uh, expanded on this but you got two sisters that yeah your typical sisters the ones young way younger than the other one so it's like the older one doesn't want the young one hanging with her when she does things. Typical storyline with that. But eventually, since they both have powers, they learn to work together and enjoy being around each other. And it just so happens that the scientist also has a daughter that was there when the accident happened. And she also got the same style powers. But her powers are like a red aura where there's, there's blue. So... I don't know why hers has to be a little bit different since the flash that happened in the original uh, mishap was a big blue burst. So you would think they'd all have the blue style powers, but I think they just do that to represent the good and the evil powers battling each other away. But so they're mad at her because they got the powers and he's trying to collect them so they can steal some of the powers back and use them to make military uh characters that have special abilities or whatever who knows the things a typical scientist wants to do with special items in the future and always use it for bad instead of good but yeah these were really fun characters i really like the way they work together main reason i bought this i thought this was newer but i found out recent very recently from anthony that this has been out for bit and been reprinted and stuff and uh with michael avon oming doing this and his significant other is taki soma when i seen the name i was kind of like hoping that maybe it had some type of representation towards taki soma that's why i picked it up but i'm really glad i did i really enjoyed it and it's yeah it's fun seeing them start out with their powers but i I'm kind of bummed that I heard out that this has been out for a while because that 
might mean we might might not see a second volume, or we might down the road. But I really like the characters. I think this would be a really fun story to move on with. So hopefully we'll see something more down the road. But I get it. Those two artists, their creators, are very, very, very busy people, constantly putting out tons of stuff. So, but yeah, see what happens. And it is from Dark Horse Comics, and yeah, that was it was a blast. So. Yeah, that originally came out back in 2011, which uh, means that I most likely talked about it on uh, my former podcast, AP Conversation, because I know myself, I think Brent is the first one that uh, told me about it because he was the big uh, Brian Michael Bendis fan. And then I kind of, pun intended, latched on to that fan. <laughs> and uh, and whenever Bendis jumps around to different publishers, so when he went to DC, they took his imprint and you know they they kept kind of republishing things and uh dark horse and so yeah it's something that uh thankfully just for accessibility purposes a lot of his creator own work uh keeps getting reprinted and uh more eyes on it and stuff but uh yeah like you said they they got very busy after the fact so uh but i also crossed the fingers for more because that was good stuff <laughs> cool cool all right uh let's jump over to katie what you got for us all right, this week I have something a little different. It's from the Spy Family manga line. It's called Spy Family, uh, the official guide, Eyes Only by Tatsuya Endo. Um, this is, I guess, kind of like a, a behind the scenes or a, a tribute book to the Spy Family manga series. Um, it has uh, recaps of all the different characters and uh, each chapter of the manga. And then it also has a whole bunch of like behind the scenes art and different uh, promotional pieces. And it has um, actually quite a bit of uh, behind the scenes and creator interviews uh, with Tatsuya Endo and the team at Shonen Jump and Biz Media and their reflections on the characters. Um, Yeah, this was, I will say for me, this was not a must read. I wanted to try it just because I've been reading this series. Um, I think this is, something that super fans would really really enjoy or perhaps maybe somebody a little younger um uh, the part that i liked the best was actually seeing the art from like okay different like promotions from japan or like things exclusive to the weekly shonen jump readers or the artist twitter account um i liked that a lot and then i definitely like the idea of the behind the scenes creator interviews i thought that was really cool you know, I, I love like DVD extras and I have a whole ton of like visual dictionaries and making of books. So those are exciting. Um, I want to say I want to praise the layout of this book and they really do a lot to. <laughs> they, they, they make they lay it out kind of like a top secret like spy file and give it that look like, oh, you know, like this has like a government only stamp on it. So the layout and the design, I feel like, is really, really clever. Um, that was quite nice. I appreciate that at the beginning of the book, um, there is full color photographs. That's really cool. And there is also a poster if you buy the book. Um, what else? Yeah, it, you know, it's a little different. It reminds me of, like, when I was little, I had, like, a book of, like, all the Pokemon from, like, the first two generations. I was, like, a Pokedex. And as I was reading this, I was getting that same feeling. Um, you know, I did not find the recapping the episodes particularly useful, but I thought that was still a really cool touch. And, you know, overall, this is just really fun. Like I said, I think this would probably be good for somebody who's, you know, a Spy Family mega fan and... um you know, it could be a great gift item for Christmas or in your Easter basket to kind of round out your collection. But I think it's a really cool concept and it definitely has a lot of value for certain readers. Um, that's my review of Spy Family, the official guide, Eyes Only by Tatsuya Endo and the team at Shonen Jump and Viz Media. Check it out. Cool. cool. All right. Uh, next one on my list is uh, something that in pre-order uh, caught my attention with the square format. Uh, I'm talking about The Last Mermaid, number one. A lone mermaid roams an endless wasteland on a quest beyond reason. To press ever onward, she must survive the uh, inner, hold on, interminable stretches 
between tiny pockets of water, the roaming bands of cybernetic cannibals, and the fearsome mutant beast. What propels her forward to take such a risk? This is story and art by Derek Kirk Kim. Um, so I saw this, and I saw the square format, and that got my attention. When it's the only square comic book that was on the shelf, I'm like, all right, what are we looking at here? And when I open it up, I saw this image first. Uh, our supporting character here, this uh, kind of little uh, kind of salamander tadpole thing thingamajig. Um, and uh, this is a very beautiful book. It's a very short read uh, dialogue wise. But the art that uh, Derek does for this is just so gorgeous that it just kind of it gives you all of the extra value you need there as you go through. I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah. Lottie. Lottie is the name of that little uh, little uh, creature there. Um, so, yeah, we just find out that this mermaid is uh, basically kind of stranded in a desert land. And in the desert land, we see this vehicle that uh, the mermaid is kind of... Um, put together it's kind of like you're in like a like a little fishbowl that's also connected to like this giant like mech suit like from avatar um the blue you know james cameron avatar um so here's like an uh an image of the uh the cybernetic robotic suit with a little fishbowl container that the mermaid and lottie are uh, resting within and we just know that they're just kind of in this wasteland we see the uh what I would assume is the Golden Gate Bridge um, is just kind of buried in sand and they're just basically running low on water. Uh, since it is a quick read, I don't really want to give too much up on that. But like I said, the art in this is just absolutely gorgeous and um, it was well worth the, uh, the experience there for any uh, lack of dialogue. Uh, that, you know, it's a big, strong having the creator doing both of the jobs here you can definitely see uh you know how masterful the script is when it comes to uh telling the story with very minimal dialogue and uh minimal characters at least in this first chapter i forget how many issues this is scheduled for but uh i don't know if this is a three four or fiver but i think uh after this first one i'm definitely going to uh, check it out I'll show off the, uh, the the back cover, and then I'm also going to show off the uh, preview image of our Lottie character for uh, what I'm assuming is going to be the cover for issue number two. So just kind of an adorable, adorable little creature there. And um, Derek had talked about in the back here uh, the story of where this character started from. And this is an, a, a drawing from, um, I think, maybe 12, 15 years ago. And uh, I'll try to zoom in a little more there. And uh, this is where this mermaid character had first started, where uh, Derek had worked with uh, within animation and uh, kind of went through the trenches and uh, within you know Disney and Warner Brothers Cartoon Network and you know just basically having steady work across all of those uh, companies. And uh, Derek goes on to kind of talk about. Uh, once COVID hit and what kind of led him to kind of go back on this character idea he had that kind of served as almost like a failed pitch to turn into something animated and realizing to kind of go back to uh, their first love, which is comic books. And that last mermaid is now in our hands and on the store shelves. So yeah, this is, this was a cool, just random pickup that just, uh, once again, the square format um, got my attention Last Mermaid, nice title, especially when you just see nothing really mermaidy about it on that front one there. So um, it made me more curious. And then uh, flipping through and catching that gorgeous art, um, this was well worth it. And uh, at the you know their standard three ninety nine price, you know something like this with being a different format, being um, you know uh, such a such a finished art, you know it feels like this is you know a more illustrated book than your typical like superhero comic book in a sense or you know has you know very boasting with colors and stuff this feels like it would be a more expensive book but i was happy to see that uh at the standard price so that is the last mermaid uh number one kirby i got thundercats number one 
I got picked it up because of the sketch cover. I loved the show when I was a kid. Uh, I watched that way more than like Transformers and stuff like that. This is done by Declan, Declan Shelby and Drew Moss. Wonderful job. I like the way they did this, but apparently they're leaving their planet because everything went wrong. They're going to their third Earth, I think it is. Yeah, a third Earth that they found. And we get to see our characters. And I was very confused by this because I don't know if you guys were into Thundercats at all back in the day. But when I watched the show, I always thought Lionel and Panthera and, and all the characters, Tigris and all them, were all basically the same age. Well, in this storyline, the ship travels and Lionel is one of three kids. I can't figure out where my camera is. One of three kids in cry cryo chambers. Okay. And they're supposed to stay young until they get to the Earth. And something goes wrong with Lionel, Lionel's. Uh, chamber and he ages mm. so he's basically a, an adult lion once they get to their new earth which is confusing to me because you have uh, this is the way i remember them you got lion panther tigress and all them and they're all roughly the same age but they played out that whole storyline with Lionel, and I just I was confused by that. So I, now I want to go back and check out the early episodes of the show, see if I am wrong off that. If he was something did happen and he did age differently than the rest of them, but you got Panther, Panther, basically doing his things, teaching him all the weaponry and stuff like that, and he eventually has to feel the battle, and he has the sword's ability where he can do the thunder, thunder, thundercats and the sword grows and all that stuff. Uh, so he's knowledgeable about that. Um, I can't remember Chitara's boyfriend's name or whatever, but he happens to be way older than the rest of them. Whereas in the show, I, re I recall him being the basically maybe a little older than the other characters, but he just seems like there's a big difference in age with those characters. So yeah, that part confused me, but I, the story was enjoyable. I do want to see where this goes, but I just picked up the sketch cover to get that. And then I was going to wait to see how long they go with this and then look into the trades, but I have a feeling this is going to go on for a while, but Basically, they get to the new planet. They're trying to figure things out. And while they're there, they get attacked by a bunch of beings that are already on that planet. And then later on in the issue, I mean, one of the beings, if you know the show, you'll recognize this lizard character here. He's one, one of the standard enemies from the show back in the days. And we do see Mumra kind of waiting to be awoken or waiting to be released from some type of prison or something, which they don't really describe. But if you know the show, you'd know the Mumra character, the basically dark mummy style character. And you look at him and he's got his aged old look to him also. But it's like, did him and these other characters go to this planet ahead of time? Or is this the start of the actual Thundercats? And that's how their whole... But I thought they were on Earth when the show was done. So that was confusing to me. So, yeah, I'll just have to figure out. I see my DNA character did that, that cover, too. So, But, uh, yeah, if you like Thundercats, I think you'll really enjoy this. I'm just a little confused about that part, but they obviously plan this going for a long time because they had all these covers. Uh, come on. Yeah, that definitely seems like a good nostalgia plan. <laughs> Holy crap. And all these. And yeah, granted, some of them are retailer exclusives and all that stuff, but wow. 
that's why I'm like, I want the trade just to get all <laughs> a ton of the covers in the back of the trades. But yeah, so I have a feeling this is going to go on for a while, but very enjoyable. The artwork, you know, from the show and all that stuff, all your characters are back. I know I was calling Tigress, but I think it's Chitara. I was screwing up some of the names, but yeah, you see him in battle and you got the two little, little cats, kitty cat and I can't remember. <laughs> They're up there with their little surf, surf items, dropping little bombs and stuff in battle, but yeah, it was a fun, fun seeing the whole team up again, seeing how it goes, seeing Lionel kind of like being a stubborn little youngster in an adult body, going off to deal with the environment and the characters when he's supposed to wait for backup and stuff like usual, the standard storyline that we get with all that, with the youngins when they got to go cause trouble. But yeah, if you like Thundercats, I'm sure you'll enjoy this and Tons of covers out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious to wonder if that, what you're talking about with the age difference and that whole thing, if that's just something new that they wanted to instill, being like, all right, let's 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 do a comic book, but let's kind of do a slightly different origin or something. I'm curious to see if that's... Yeah, because I'm pretty sure they were on a different planet in the show, because I thought, I think they were in, on Thundera. I think the planet was called, so... That could have been Earth 2, and now they're going to Earth 3. Oh, no, that wouldn't make sense, though, because he was an adult then. So, yeah, I'm guessing it's just a no, whole new replay of it. Okay, next up, uh, the last book that I have is uh, another pick off of the shelf. Um, I have been really in the mood of a lot of the continuing series that's been going on. I got a lot of stuff piling up, and I've just been kind of more intrigued to kind of browse some of the shelves, see what that I have. Uh, Maybe missed out in the pre-orders. And that was another one with uh, something called Man's uh, Man's Best, um, number one. Homeward bound on an alien planet, Man's Best follows three emotional support pets living on the Starship Horizon, a spacecraft searching for a new planet to house a humanity uh, compromised by bad decisions and corporate corruption. But after the ship crashes and their crew is captured, these loyal pets are their owner's only hope. Outfitted in outrageous mech suits. Uh, the two books in a row that I randomly picked up with mech suits. Um, uh, these three best friends must uh, traverse a hostile world to rescue their owners, leaving them the only hope for a humanity that might not be worth saving in an adventure threatening to tear their friendship apart. This is an action-packed sci-fi romp with something to say in a tale that spans the furthest reaches of space to tug at readers' hearts. This is done, and I believe the... Oh, I have the full creator names here, but uh, Pornsack, Pichet, Schott. Um, I apologize if I mispronounce any of that. Uh, Jesse Longer, Longer and Jeff Powell. I'm pretty confident in the Jeff Powell one. I even spelled out the uh, the uh, porn sacks name and the last name. All right. Anyways, man's best. <laughs> here we go. This is a brand new comic book. We are going to talk about it here. Uh, Kirby's laughing, so I'm laughing. Shelly's probably laughing. Oh, there's Katie. We're all laughing, having a good time. Anyways, um, this was something that I saw these three animals looking up in this colorful, you know, beautiful looking galaxy. These animals are, you know, wearing like suits and stuff and i just like oh what is this and um yeah this is a fun little tale i didn't know quite what to expect we kind of open up with this like danger room scenario where uh these animals are basically facing off against what they call clangers and clangers are these like giant you know threatening robots and uh we just see our animal team uh, going up against them and uh and we we quick we're quick to find out that it is basically a danger room scenario like the X-Men where they're basically in training. So we see like the grid, you know, everything fold away and they're in this like grid room here. And that was all just part of this simulation basically. And we have these uh, group of like scientists, uh, the people that are in space researching a planet that has gone missing. And um, the scientist has these emotional support animals and, uh, it's interesting to see like what the reasoning is for 
putting these animals to the test here. Now, the animals are talking to each other throughout this comic book, but it's done in a way where they're only talking to each other and none of the humans can hear them. And it is, uh, you know, by the end of this issue, you you realize what they are kind of being prepped for. So I'm not going to, you know, talk about a lot of stuff from here on out. But uh, these animals are just kind of talking about, uh, you know, doing their job and protecting the owner and and other people on the spaceship aren't too keen of of the scientists kind of uh, taking her time to, you know, working with these pets when there's other things that, you know, they should be doing as they're kind of going through the galaxy and investigating, you know, missing planets and such. Um, there is a sort of a, no pun intended, but a catastrophe happens. And our uh, characters are, you know, our spaceship and everything gets, uh, kind of has to do a crash landing on this uh, mysterious planet. And our animals are kind of, um, kind of left to um, kind of go back on their training or they're kind of left with their training abilities to realize what they need to do next. Um, so yeah, that's kind of an overall sell, um, kind of gets the gist of it. Hey, I thought it was pretty fun. Um, halfway through, I wasn't sure if this is something I'm going to carry on with. Another one, too, that I think is just a handful of issues, a limited series. Um, but by the end, and kind of seeing the purpose of what these animals, uh, why they were kind of put, you know, they were put through these tests. But when I say that, it's not done. They're not being, like, tortured or anything. They're putting through these simulations where they are, you know, fighting bad robots and stuff like that. Um so they're all safe at the end of the day. Um, but by the end of this issue, I was pretty curious to see how they're going to take those skills and uh, use them for the conundrum that they get, that everybody gets in by the end of the issue. So that's all I kind of want to say about that one there. But yeah, this was another fun read. Two uh, titles, this one and The Last Mermaid that I just picked up randomly, uh, looking for number ones to talk about. And uh yeah, they really did hook me, and I'm going to follow through on the rest of these uh, limited series here. So that is Man's Best, issue number one. We have uh, one more review for the weeklies, and uh, let's kick it over to Kirby. I got What If Venom, number one. I picked up the sketch cover, but they did what I really love when you order a sketch cover and gave you the regular cover also. So they just got the sketch cover in front of it, and they also the cover they gave me was the one that I really wanted, anyways. Other than the sketch cover, that has all the characters combined together, which is awesome. It's like you got She Hog, Hulk, Doctor Strange, Venom, Moon Knight, Wolverine, all crossover together, Loki, and it's like a nice little combination. But years ago, Eddie Brock was a reporter whose career was ruined, and he contemplated ending his own life. But he found a kindred spirit, an ex extraterrestrial parasite, parasitic alien called a symbiote. The creature, the creature bonded to him. I can't talk anymore. And the two were joined together. They became Venom. Jennifer Walters was a shy attorney when she was gunned down by criminals. A gamma irradi irradiated blood transfusion from her cousin Bruce Banner, a.k.a. the Incredible Hulk didn't just give her a second chance at life, but also super strength and bulletproof green skin. She became She-Hulk. And in this story, we get to see uh, first off, I want to give Jeremy Holt and Jesus Hervat, Hervais, what are the creators on this one? I wasn't big on the character artwork uh, she Hulk just has a different flow to her than what I'm used to, so that was a little off. But I did like it when she was symbioted out and stuff. But we get to see her and Eddie Brack dealing with some stuff. She kind of confronts Eddie, trying to stop him from doing something stupid. He's depressed, he's thinking about giving everything up. And the symbiote's like, Well, he's too weak, I don't want to mess with him. But then this big green gal walks in the door and it's like she's got extra strength she can handle me she's got an interesting uh demeanor with her and with her, her having the radiation and all that stuff being hulked up the symbiote gets all excited and decides i'm going to take over i'm going to 
join up with her and we get to see her become the new Venom character. I loved how they did this. I like her with her Venom crossover. Um, this is the image that I liked when she's all Venomed out with the little alien head and stuff. I thought that was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, she basically because of her Venomization and the stuff she's doing on the side, she kind of loses her job. I mean, they don't really show it or nothing, but later on she's walking the streets, uh, hanging with the homeless, kind of lost all her financial abilities and stuff. So she's just hanging out with all them. And uh, we hear her talk about not having a job and everything. And while she's just trying to figure things out, dealing with hunger problems, <laughs> looking for some baddies to pick up and have a little snack with, <laughs> she happens to come across Sabretooth and Sabretooth attacks her. And he's got, he mentions the special belt that he has. I'm guessing it's got some interesting sound alarms or something that he's going to do with it, but we don't get to see him use it in this battle. And they battle away and then it's basically, you get to see her just dealing with, trying to not get noticed for certain things and the cops and authorities showing up and dealing with all the mess around and everything and then it just leaves her going off and we see a interesting character in a bar that comes up to a, another character that just so happens to have a, a shadowy image that you might notice with the hair with the two corners peaked up and stuff and so we're going to see, as you would expect, anytime you see Sabretooth, you're going to see Wolverine nearby. So you're going to see those two cross over. But yeah, I, I like, I'd love to see how this goes. Um, I think it's a five issue run. I just picked up this first one just because of the sketch cover. But now I'm going to definitely check out the rest of the series with it. See what happens with it. I'm used to the one ifs being a one shot. So. That's why I decided I'd only pick up the first one. But after reading it, of course, I'm sucked into it. And I've been enjoying anything with She-Hulk that they've been putting out in the past couple of years. So that character's growing on me. Oh, cool. All right, then. That is going to do it for the weekly reviews. But we have another great segment, and that is the news. And now the news. All right, welcome to part two of two of our previews preview, jumping into the giant previews catalog with the independent publishers. We're going to go back and forth, talk about what we are excited about. The first one that I flagged here, uh, long have been excited for it as we uh, wrap up this uh, this first arc for Happy Astronaut uh, with issue number five. And the reason I'm highlighting it here, because we're often talking about Happy Astronaut, but Art Baltazar has a uh, awesome variant cover um, it is super cool. So cool that they had to do the virgin treatment to it and get the title off of there and everything. So there are two versions of that uh, cover there and uh, Happy Astronaut number five. And I believe the plan is that now that they have the five issues that they could uh, have enough for a trade paperback and see where to go with Happy from there. But a uh, good time to jump in on those single issues because that is important. So that is Happy Astronaut number five. So they are stopping the this run at five? I think with this story arc of what they're oh, doing. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if I can say anything else, so I'm just leaving yeah. it at that. So. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right. I am so excited that this is out. But we got Space Ghost, number one, coming out. Greed and corruption flourish in the darkness between stars. With the territories of the Galactic Federation spread far and wide across the vastness of space. Pirates and hijackers ransack the distant colonies with cruel disregard for the innocent scientists living within them. Yet there is a cosmic vigilante who meets, who meddies out justice throughout the galaxy, bringing vengeance to those who prey upon the defenseless. 
Some say he is a policeman who has abandoned the, the strictures of the law. Others say he is a phantom, the sole survivor of a war-torn planet. And those who have survived his wrath claim he is more a force of nature, able to bend the very elements of creation to decimate his enemies. They call him the Space Ghost, and his adventure begins here. At David Popoz and Jonathan Lau working on this, I by the covers, I'm kind of curious if they're going to go more adult or if they're going to stay with the Space Ghost cartoon style or not. But either way, I'm good with it. Yeah, that cover too had me thinking the same thing. It seemed like it was like, oh, we're going, yeah, full yep. up edition with it or something. But cool, cool. Uh, jump over to Katie. Anything from the catalog? Sure. There is a really cool Legolas uh, statue uh, in the toys and collectibles section. It is awesome. Got Leggy doing his uh, trademark bow pose. Um, something that I appreciated about it is that it was a mid-level price. It was $80. So more expensive than, uh, say, like, you know, some of the regular Funko Pops or the mini Epics, but definitely less pricey uh, than the Weta Signature Series. Uh, all of those are lovely depending on your taste, but, you know, the Weta ones, we're talking hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. But this at $80, I thought was a really good value for a statue that looks pretty cool so anyway uh i'll start it out with a legolas statue is that based off of the movie version or just like a oh good question yes it's the the movie version uh orlando you know so bloom? it looks like orlando bloom in the elf costume so cool um and uh if you're watching the youtube video this is gonna if you're listening to the audio this is why you're going to subscribe to the youtube version i forgot to do this when we started the previews but i was going to take my catalog <laughs> I was going to take, oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay, cool. I meant to do this when we started. I was going to take my catalog off of the bookshelf over here. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to uh, do this here. Nope, that didn't work. Let's try it on this side. Oh, this side will look cooler. All right, where's my previews catalog? Oh, here it is. Wait, no, hold on. No, okay. All right, there (laughs) we go. (laughs) I tried. All right. uh, Next one I'm going to talk about here is uh, going to be coming up in two seconds. And here it is. Over at Image Comics, there's quite a few things that got me interested. Uh, Ain't No Grave, number one. And what got me interested is because I see Scotty Young's name is there. So Scotty Young is working again with Jorge Corona. There's a miniseries premiere. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, They were the team that did uh, Middle West and The Me You Love in the Dark, which I know I talked uh, high praise about both of those on this very show. Um, They're back together with an all-new miniseries, Ain't No Grave. This Unforgiven-style journey is an original macabre Western fantasy tale for mature readers told through a Guillermo del Toro-esque lens. Uh, Render put her... Hold on here. uh, Writer put her violent past behind her when she fell in love and became a mother. But that was before she learned it was all going to be taken away. Now she has to pick up her guns once again and ride to kill one, uh, the one who's behind the threat, which just so happens to be death, capital D death, by the way. The genre genre bending adventure begins in this double-sized burst issue with 40 page stories and no ads, no ads. But uh, Scotty Young is just crushing it ever since he, it, I, I say it as if he just did it last year, but now it's probably been like 10 years and he's been doing, you know, uh, stepping out from behind the artist desk and taking on the writing task while still doing some art projects and stuff too. But um, he's just, everything he comes up with, with his uh, original uh, series, I get them all just because he's, he's an awesome dude. And each one just keeps ensuring the fact that I'm buying the next, no matter what, what it is, what genre it is, is a Western fantasy. This might not be something that I would normally pick up just off the shelf normally, but I trust in Scotty Young's storytelling, especially working with uh, Jorge on this one again. So that is Ain't No Grave, issue number one. And I'm just going to stretch that out because I see Kirby uh, will be with us in just a second. But I am so excited for that one. Uh, That one's coming from Image Comics. And now we are going to jump over to Kirby maybe with his next pick in just a second or two 
or three. So Kirby, what you got? All right. My next one is Monolith, number one. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mini series premiere. The origin of the hulking hell spawn is finally revealed. What connection does he have to one of the most savage of his kind? Omega Spawn. Follow his journey from the cosmic depths of Deep Spawn to his first encounter with Al Simmons in this three-part miniseries. I'm looking forward to this because I, I like that character where we got the little teaser in the past. He's a big, huge Hulk-like Red Hulk Spawn type character. And uh, we just ended the big spawn run with Spawn 350. So with a whole new spawn thing going on and starting up, I'm hoping this character starts making a presence. But yeah, I think it's a three or four issue run to start with. Three part, yep, three part miniseries. All right, Katie. Okay, so uh, I have from Tokyo Pop and Disney, uh, Stitch the Manga Collection. So this is collecting uh, two volumes of the Stitch manga. Uh, it is by Yumi Sukarino uh, doing the art and the writing. And then the cover art is by Now Kodaka. Uh, this is going to be uh, actually available in July for $15. Um, a few months ago, I reviewed a Stitch and the Samurai manga that was surprisingly really, really good. I had just picked it up because I'm like, that, that's kind of a unique concept. But it was really good. So I'd be willing to give this uh, a chance as well. Um, and in between now and then, something that I've learned is that uh, Stitch is actually a really popular character in Japan. So it looks like in this manga, he's going to be uh, visiting the Okinawa Islands. And I think that could be really special for uh, Japanese readers as well as people uh, who like Stitch because I know he's a really popular character. But uh, yeah, Stitch the Manga Collection for $15 on July 31st. Check it out. Now, also from Sean Lewis, which I'm going to assume is the same person that Kirby just talked about, uh, Bear Pirate Viking Queen number one. Um, let's see here. From Sean Lewis of the King Spawn comes a blood splattered story of conquest. Bears, pirates, Vikings, and queens all battling for their claim to determine what the world will become. Rendered in stunning watercolor by artist Jonathan Marks Bravicha, Bravicia. It's a gorgeous story of the blood spilled to make countries. And what's cooler than bears, pirates, Vikings, and queens? Uh, 72 stunning pages. It's sure to be one of the most beautiful and thought-provoking books of the year. But uh, once again, it's another you know genre that I might not jump into. But it's called Bear, Pirate, Viking, Queen. So <laughs> that just sounds... Uh, even though I don't think the Viking Queen is a, a pirate bear, I'm not sure exactly what here, but... Putting all that in the title, I'll check it out. Uh, Bear, Pirate, Viking Queen, number one. Kirby? This one is an ongoing, but I'm picking up this one issue for a reason. This is done by Simon Kodransky. We got something epic number 10. With no new leads to follow, our detective duo schedules a meeting with a most unusual epic whose unique abilities might help them make a break in the case. And the reason I'm picking it up is because there's a certain duck on two of the covers, the Game Boy cover and that other cover that's kind of a diehard movie poster style cover, and it's Howard the Duck. So apparently he's coming in to help whoever these characters are. I know nothing about the something epic series. I do like Simon Kadrensky's stuff that I've read in the past, so I'm curious about that. What page but is that? That is page 134. And the one with the... Uh, <laughs> what did I just say? The Bruce Willis movie. Uh, Die Hard cover has deductive on the top. So duck detective. But, but yeah, I'm going to get the two covers with the duck on it. The Game Boy one and the other one. Hopefully it has Howard in it. Otherwise, I'm just spending money on two covers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with not knowing anything about this and what publisher is this one? Uh, uh, Something this... epic is Image. Is it? Yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah so I, I have actually read a few issues of that, and what I've read is really good. Okay. So I wonder if they're just taking something kind of like 
That's kind of like what Crossover did, even though they used the yeah. characters and had the rights, but it seems like something like this, you know, it might just be as close to Howard the Duck as they could get for legal reasons or something, but... I yeah, would say cool. that is what they're doing. They're doing like a whole bunch of like 80s and 90s tribute covers as well, so yeah. Well, that Game Boy one looks pretty sweet, so oh yeah, there it says <laughs> Image Comics right now. Yeah, there. I can't decide which one, so I bought both. <laughs> for sure. No, I think you'll like it. It's It's cool. pretty good. Yeah, I think you just sold the cover to me there. Okay, um, Katie. Okay, at Dark Horse, I have Star Wars Hyperspace Stories Qui-Gon Jinn. Uh, this is a, a graphic novel. Uh, it's going to be the start of an all-new line where they're kind of doing a deep dive focus onto different characters uh, to start with Qui-Gon Jinn, naturally. Uh, it's written by George Mann, and the art is by Andrea Moody, Gigi Baldassini and Comic Craft. Um, it th- the date on this book has moved around quite a bit. I pre-ordered this a while ago. It was coming in spring, then it was coming in August. Now it's coming on October twenty third, twenty twenty four. So you do have a lot of time to get your pre-orders in. Uh, it is twenty dollars, and uh, this is Dark Horse Comics is proud to announce the launch of our new Star Wars Hyperspace Stories original graphic novel line. Each volume stands alone as a brilliant showcase of some of Star Wars' most iconic characters like Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Kylo Ren, Rey, and even Darth Vader. Um, I'm excited for this. I like that character. I, you know, I think Liam Neeson did a great job playing him. And I'm also, okay, so when Dark Horse got the license back for Star Wars, I was really excited. I have to say, a lot of what they've put out for me has been really hit or miss in terms of like, you know a must read or not i'm excited for this because i want to give them another chance and see how this goes um they've been doing a lot of the anthology stuff or the younger reader stuff so for what it is that you know it's certainly fine uh there's definitely a lot of good in there to enjoy i've just found that there's been a fair amount of things where i'm like yeah i did not really benefit a lot from this so i'm excited to give them another chance and see if this format works better for them uh, everything I've read by George Mann has been excellent, and I'm just generally excited for this concept and for Star Wars hyperspace stories. Qui Gon Jinn, check it out. Cool, cool. Also, at Image, they have a new number one called uh, Gromit's Number One. I happen to notice a creator in here that uh, not only Rick Remender, which is good enough there, but Brian Posehn, um, as well as artist Brett. Carson and Marina Denicio. Miniseries premiere, Two Best Friend Outcast navigate the Sacramento suburbs of 1984 where they find a home in skateboard culture and punk rock. On one side of the coin, Gromitz is an authentic look at 80s skate culture, a snapshot of the generation that turned skating into a worldwide phenomenon. On the other, it's a heartfelt coming-of-age story that follows two friends from troubled homes as they navigate their damage uh, in an area when no one is cared or no one cared. Um, but yeah, seeing Brian Passane's name attached to that, uh, yeah, I'll definitely give it a shot. So that is Gromit's number one. I, <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> I like Popeye number one. Popeye, arguably one of the most iconic characters in comic book history, makes his return to comic shops this May. The century-old comic strip and legendary cartoon character is reimagined for the modern age in this brand-new series by Marcus Williams. I Lie Popeye reimagines the pop culture staple in a high-energy manga-inspired monthly comic series that explores Popeye's past and finally reveals the century-long mystery of how he lost his eye. Was it an epic battle or some nautical accident? The truth finally comes out as an old enemy from the sea returns to face off against the legendary sailor man. It's like, I'm not a huge Popeye fan. I'm never big on the whole Bluto thing and all that stuff. But I like a couple of the other characters. I don't know if I'm going to jump on the first issue or if I'm going to wait for the trade on this or not. But with it be manga crossover and stuff, the art looks like awesome. I want to check it out because of that. And I want to know what's up with his eye. I could have swore back in the days he had two eyes. I don't remember him missing an eye. So something happened somewhere, so I got to find out what happened. 
<laughs> Blow me down. That's the best I can say. Um, jumping over to Archie Comics. Uh, actually, no, we're going to jump over to Katie because Katie's next. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, another Star Wars title. We have Star Wars The Mandalorian Manga Volume 2. It's by Viz Media and Disney Lucasfilm. Uh, a few months ago, I reviewed Volume 1, which was basically episode one as a manga um but if you are a big mandalorian fan and you're looking for a way to try out manga i think you'd probably enjoy this uh it's by yusuke osawa and this looks like it's going to be following episodes two and three of season one uh, it will be in shops on may 8th and it costs 15 dollars. check it out and volume one is available right now Cool, cool, cool. Uh, jumping over to Archie Comics. Um, this is something that really caught my attention because we talk about them all the time. Archie Comics with their horror line, The Chilling Adventure Presents, all these one shot anthology type things. But what I noticed quickly about this one, it doesn't have The Chilling Adventure Presents on it. It's strictly Archie Comics Judgment Day. And this is part of a three issue uh, event series that they're doing um which is kind of hearkening back to the afterlife with archie and jughead the hunger type of storytelling rather than just being one shots with random characters throughout the series this is archie comics the judgment day number one by aubrey sitterson and megan hutchinson uh hutchison and uh in a world overrun with demons archie andrews is on a quest to cleanse riverdale of of all wicked kind uh, harnessing the destructive power of a captive fiend, he will have to destroy corrupted and possessed versions of the people closest to him. Questioning his own mortality uh, and forced to make difficult sacrifices, are Archie's efforts truly good or the work of pure evil? Traverse the most horrifying version of Riverdale yet in the first Archie premiere event. So yeah, this is something that they're saying... Archie premium events provide captivating storytelling in a collector quality format, major mini series, hard stock covers, fantastic finishes. Um, yeah, this is a whole new kind of branding. Um, I don't know if that's just their way of saying that we want to charge you an extra dollar for it because that's what's happening. But um, I'm a big fan of all their stuff. And I'm not sure if I've seen Jay Lee draw any Archie horror stuff and I uh, love Jay Lee's art, and I saw that cover, and even there's a Francesco Francavilla, which is usually expected with Archie Horror stuff, but uh, Jay Lee, that was one where I'm, it looks so cool, because, um, you know, Betty and Veronica, uh, Archie's has, like, a demonic look in a mirror, but Betty and Veronica have their heads on pikes, you know, uh, next to it there. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on, and um, yeah. This, this looks crazy, so that's Archie Comics' Judgment Day, number one of three. Yeah, that one sounds good, but since they were going with a few issues, I was going to wait and see what the trade was like. So, uh, they have another Grim Fairy Tales 2024, May the 4th Cosplay pinup special coming out again. I got the last two years worth of these, and I really enjoy them because the short story was awesome. Again, they got your cosplay pinups and then a nice short story to go with it so i will be picking that up again cool, cool katie my last pick is one that sent me on a little bit of a deep dive we have psycho ko the colossal comic compendium trade paperback um long time listeners will know that um psycho ko was an alternate comics uh, book back when we reviewed it here on the club i know i brought it and i think a couple other readers did as well it was by rob feldman um and it looks like uh he took the story to a publisher called rocket ship and last year uh ran a kickstarter for this comics compendium and i guess it was successful because it's now going to be in shops on may 22nd of 2024 for 17 dollars um Psycho KO is an original creation for this comic book who's it's very much like like a Hanna-Barbera cartoon in comics form it's I really liked it I was actually thinking about rereading it to see if it held up to me um, but him and his sidekicks go on wacky adventures um, I would say it's probably all ages you know nothing particularly violent or brutal or bad language in there um, very fun very colorful and yeah, I am now interested to hear if 
and why they are not publishing with Alterna. I know um, the creators did retain the rights, so it could just be like, hey, you know, our, our time here at this company has ended and we're going to move to this one to publish um, this uh, compendium. But anyway, I was excited to see this and a little confused. We have Psycho KO's Colossal Comics Compendium. Check it out. Okay. All right, the next one I'm talking about is uh, part of a, a bigger uh, topic that is starting this summer with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because we have a lot of turtle stuff happening uh, over there. But this is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Alpha, Jason Aaron and Tom Waltz uh, with Chris Burnham and Gavin Smith. Uh, what's the world like without TMNT? Since their time-spanning victory over Ar Armagon, uh, the Turtles have started to pursue other interests, leaving a void in New York among humans and mutants alike. The special issue explores the effects uh, this change has on uh, those connected to the brothers, from Old Hob to Jenica, across the five boroughs, and all the way through Mutant Island. It's hard to tell how important someone is until they're gone. And who better to write such a story than Tom Waltz, the man who scripted the first 100 issues of IDW series and the co-writer of The, the Last Ronin, and returning uh, artist Gavin Smith. Also get your first glimpse of what's coming in a special prequel to the new Ninja Turtles number one, written by superstar scribe Jason Aaron. Uh, so blah, blah, blah. This is kind of starting, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be getting into the new regime after issue 150. So it looks like they have a couple things to kind of tie up and tie things together and launch it off in a new direction. I don't know what the plan is. I don't think anyone knows what the plan is beyond the creators, but I've been reading those main turtle issues. This will be a part of it as well. So I'm excited to see uh, what this elf issue is going to be about. And uh, yeah. That's uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles coming in uh, the summer. All right. Speaking of anniversaries, we got Godzilla's 70th anniversary special. Yes. Celebrating 70 years of Godzilla since 1954. Godzilla has been king of the monsters, and what better way to celebrate than with a gigantic anthology of tales that get to the heart of Godzilla's last popularity or lasting popularity from the american old west to modern tokyo and beyond this collection features stories of the king of monsters fighting with its allies like mothra against old enemies like the terrible mecha godzilla and reshaping the lives of all who fall in its path nine titanic stories by first time and beloved godzilla creators alike including joelle jones michael conrad Matt Frank, James Stoko, uh, Adam Gorham, Dan Didio, and many more. Yeah, I like the anniversary specials, and I'm picking that one up. Oh, you had mentioned Joel Jones in there, so it looks like I'm adding that to my list as well. So. <laughs> I just keep making you buy stuff. I know, right? <laughs> I should get a kickback. <laughs> Let's end the show right now. Um all right, uh, my next one, still Turtles related. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, black, white, and green. Number one, a new Kirby would be on board for that. Uh, it's the Ninja Turtles like you've never seen them before. This special series gathers up some of the comics' most eclectic and exciting talent to bring their takes on the Ninja Turtles to page, taking the characters back to their origins in black and white independent comics, but with a touch of green. Uh, thrill to all new adventures by the likes of uh, Paulina Ganaccio, Declan Shelby, and more. Uh, yep, so we're always giving praise to all the black, white, and blank type of uh, covers, or uh, series, rather. And uh, yep, this is Ninja Turtles, so this seems like it'll be uh, another fun one to pick up. So, yeah, Definite no-brainer. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, Kirby? All right, my last one. Tom Holland's Fright Night, Evil Ed Rising. Wasn't thrilled with the series, but this is a one-shot. I like the Evil Ed, Ed character. Figure for a couple bucks, I'll just pick it up. What the heck? Plucked straight from the cult classic horror franchise, Fright Night. Fan favorite character, Evil Ed is back. And he's left Charlie, Amy, and Peter in the shadows. He's a vampire without rules, without cares, and without a future. Follow everyone's favorite horror fan turned creature of the night 
as he embarks on a solo journey to find some type of meaning to his new existence. Haunted by memories of Jerry Dandridge and his former life, a new threat has emerged which could bring it all crumbling down around him. Uh, don't miss out on this one-shot feeding frenzy of fangs and fun. You're so cool, Brewster. Uh, yeah, it's the way the Fright Night series is ending up. Evil Ed kind of comes in and helps everybody out and then kind of disappears. And you see him with a little gang that's hanging out with him of other vampires. So I'm hoping he goes on the good front and just see where this goes. But yeah. See what happens. Okay. I've got a couple more here. This will finish off the catalog. Um, this is a graphic novel called Always Anthony. Um, <laughs> Friends, Bullies, Middle School. And uh, hold on. I thought I was going to say anthology, but it says Anthony. Anthony is TPFW, which stands for Too Popular for Words, Love Science, Hates Writing. Uh, Leah is a super shy nerd who finally is making friends friends of her own. What could they have in common? A lot more than they thought, as it turns out. But then one day, they witness Anthony's teammates bullying a sixth grader. What happens next could cement their new friendship or blow it up forever. Um, my name's Anthony. It says Anthony on here. I don't come across that too often. I know uh, Kirby slash Kevin will point that out if there's a, a Kevin or if he's got, you know nieces or nephews with their names on books and stuff and i i don't think i've come across this before and um and when i shared it with a friend apparently uh her daughter reads this series and there's several books so i don't know if there's a character that exists in other ones and this is focusing on anthony um but yeah so at the very least i'm gonna check it out and uh probably read it and i can pass it along to someone who is following the series too but yeah this is um Oh, yeah, it's under the series name of Emmy and Friends, Always Anthony Graphic Novels. So we'll see what's going on. All right, I've got three bookmarked on these two pages, so i got to figure out what I'm showing off here. Oh, yes, from First Second Books that I love talking about, this is from Kyle Starks, who we've been talking about in the last handful of years. Karate Prom, Graphic Novel. I could just stop right there because it's called Karate Prom. Um Let's see here. Don the Dragon Wilson Jones is the uh, finest fighter Benjamin Harrison High School has ever produced. But when he enters the ring against Lincoln High's Sam Stedman, it's love at first knockout. Unfortunately, Sam has a jerky ex-boyfriend and Don has seriously terrifying ex-girlfriend. Uh, a global crime cartel terrifying Hold on here. Oh, okay, I see what it says. And Don has seriously terrifying ex-girlfriend, like global crime cartel terrifying. That's how you read that. From prom to after party to graduation, Don and Sam and an increasingly uh, eclectic, second time I've said that word today, cast of supporting oddballs will have to fight their way through a gauntlet of opponents, all in the name of love and punching. Did we mention the punching? <laughs> Fast-paced, madcap, and completely free of any kind of redeeming or morally thoughtful content, Karate Prom is a love homage to teen comedies of the 80s, as well as badly dubbed kung fu films. There's a lot going on, but it's Kyle Stark, so that's a huge win. Uh, looks like they're doing writing, art, and cover art, and it's called Karate Prom. So yes, I am picking up Karate Prom. The next one is from, next two are from Floating World Comics. We've talked about that, the creators from the Santo Sisters. So they have something called American Nature Presents from Greg and Fake and Mark Koprinar, hold on, Koprinarov. Um, a newsprint explosion of comics and entertainment. Sink your teeth into brand new Santo Sisters adventure. Struggle to contain your laughter at Josh Penning. Penninger's Tedward, I don't know what any of these words are, um, and explore a treasure trove of articles. This ain't your average mag. It's a raw, uh, unapologetic celebration of comics culture. Walk on the wild side. Yeah, this is, I'm not quite sure what to get here. It looks like it's just going to be a combination of comics and magazine stuff. And but... Yeah, I, I thought I had that one marked too, 
because I'm I'm getting it. But yeah, I think it's going to come magazine size. It's going to be kind of like a collaboration of different things. Yeah, and it sounds like Santos Sisters will have like a story in there with a bunch of other new creations or something. What? But um, yeah, American Nature presents number one. So, um, and uh, next thing also from Floating World, um, it's called Sept N Ember One Shot. Sept and her alter ego Ember wander the weird magical wasteland world of the Red Wrenchies, encountering many dangers and wonderful sights along the way. 32 pages of art and text, this little poetic narrative is a tie-in and companion piece to the soon forthcoming and ongoing comic Robot Todd. There's a lot of words. I don't understand what's happening there, but I see Sept and Ember. It's a one-shot. It's a mature-themed book. A ten dollar price tag, uh, thirty two pages, so it is kind of an upscale thing, but it looks like it's a, uh, you know, comics and prose, and it just looks like an interesting experiment. I'm curious to see what any of that stuff means. So yeah, I'll give that a shot. And I think the last one on my list, the other one I bookmarked was that Game Boy thing. I have to add to the order. Um, Toxic Summer Number One. This is from writer artist Derek Charm. From the mutated mind of Eisner award-winning cartoonist uh, who did Jughead and the unbeatable Squirrel Girl comes a monster-sized 48-page nightmare beach party that will keep you up all night if you can live long enough to tell the tale. Best friends Ben and Leo had the perfect summer planned after high school graduation. As lifeguards in the idyllic beach town of Port Dorian, They were planning for three months of hot guys, late night bonfires, and no regrets until a toxic spill of unknown properties on the beach transformed their dream summer into a waking nightmare. Now Port Dorian is flooded with panicked tourists and a horrifying pack of subhuman monstrosities is snatching beachgoers in the night. Now I'm looking at all this. I'm familiar with Derek Charm. I'm like, all right, do I need to add another uh, book to the list here? There's a bunch of cool covers. I'm like, you know what? I can skip this. But then they hook me in uh, with this uh, next tale here. Mix one part Riverdale with one part Creature from the Black Lagoon and drink it down fast because this bi-monthly horror shocker comes packed with enough acidic sludge, perverted beach maniacs, and ill will to ruin anyone's first summer away from home. So, yeah. It sounds like a wacky time and I'm going to check it out. So, um yeah, and the art style just pops. It's just so colorful. Yeah, yeah. And there's a an all yellow uh, sketch cover there, Kirby, too. Yeah. <laughs> Not to try to sell you a comic book to get eaten. But... <laughs> Anyways, um, that's it for the catalog. We could barely cover, you know, a, a small portion of this because uh, there was so much going on. Uh, it's reversible. Here's that Space Ghost thing. Uh, there's so much stuff that is going on in this catalog, so we highly recommend to reach out to your local comic book shop, ask for the previews catalog, flip through it, see what's interesting, take some of our recommendations, add some um, to it, and uh, make your list. Check them out with your online uh, retailers of choice as well if you don't have a local comic shop near you. There's so much stuff in the catalogs that's important to check out. So that is going to do it for our preview section for the March catalogs for May and beyond. Um, And that's going to do it for this episode. Jump over to plugs. I want to give a shout out to uh, the the finished video version of the YouTube show. We'll see an advertisement for the Gift Nook, which is a local shop to us. All the information is in that video ad, um, but I have some art there. So I am one of the new vendors and artists and crafters that is part of the Gift Nook. Um, our friends uh, own and run the shop and there's a bunch of cool creators in there so there's a fun little video advertisement otherwise check out the gift nook over on instagram and facebook for more information uh, if you're local to us uh, check it out but they've also talked about that they've had people that were visiting from other countries that were here for other like related things for like you know kettle moraine related things and they drove past and saw the gift nook and were intrigued. And I think they said they were from Germany and Germany and stuff. So anytime I advertise this stuff, I always think being like, well, if you're in the area, you know, you're not going to just go from Florida just to come to this, you know, shop and check this out or something. But yeah, then we had some, uh, you know, they had some people from Germany that showed up and just happened, 
happen to walk into their magical little land. So it's always worth a shot to shout that out. So um, that's the first plug. Uh, upcoming events. Uh, I can take that one off the list here. Because, yeah, I don't think I talked about this one yet. Um, Comic First, Lucky Dogs and Nina. Because um, I think when we last recorded, I think it was the day before that convention. Uh, another fun turnout. Uh, once again, thank you to uh, Kirby and Shelly for showing up and uh, purchasing some art. Uh, Shelly had made a request for some uh, Adams Family, and uh, I did a good enough job that she wanted to buy all of them. And uh, I was very proud of that piece and uh, I want to put together as some kind of cool collage and stuff and like a Brady Bunch style or something. And then um, she also has this card, which I forgot to give to her, but I'm holding it hostage right here. This is my, uh, <laughs> the uh, um, uh, Sven Gulli, uh <laughs> sketch card I did there, but no, over at comic first, uh, Nina and lucky dogs, you know, it's a small little convention, comic and toy show and stuff. And, uh, I can guarantee that everything on my table was not anywhere else at anybody else's table. So I had all original stuff, but it's always cool to make the connections, see the new customers. And it's always <laughs> worth my time to, um, to uh, show people the art and spread the word. Um, and then Sunday, May 5th, Madison Mighty Con. That's the next big event for myself. And I think just David senior, I think that was a confirmation. I'm not sure if, uh, uh, David Gloyd Jr. is going to be at that one, uh, but we are going to be trying to get um, David's daughter, Katie, who does the, uh, we talked about the specimen, uh, where uh, I know he's working on trying to get her to uh, jump in and show up at the show as well. So, um, but yeah, uh, at least myself and David Sr. will be there. And that's Sunday, May 5th, Madison Mighty Con. I'm coming up with some new stuff to have on the table as, and David is working on some new stuff as well. So check that out. Uh, Which that, is also the day after Free Comic Book Day. Yep, yep. So uh, go out there and have your adventures for Free Comic Book Day. We won't have a show, a Crimson show that weekend, because I will be in Skokie, Illinois, not only for Art Balthazar's uh, Cat in the Hat, Dr. Seuss uh, release, um, and they announced a bunch of awesome creators. Uh, um, the Santos sister creators are going to be at Oh Yeah Comics Skokie as part of their- Dragon uh, Fake. Yep, yep. They're going to be part of their, uh, you know, free comic book day um, hangout and some other uh, creators too that they got there. So there'll be a lot of fun stuff happening that weekend. But um, so, yeah, while we won't have a Crimson Comic Club, um, we'll have an episode that drops. Because um, well, actually, you know what? The weekend before is C2E2. That's mm -hmm. right. So I actually, based on the drop, forget what I just said. Um, <laughs> anyways uh check that out a lot of cool stuff quick plugs crimsoncowl.com for info and original web comics crimson Cowl comic club on itunes for the audio version subscribe rate and review if you are listening to the audio and you're like why was he talking about being in a library and and what about that uh legless legless statue legolas legolas i'm not a lord of the rings person but legolas i think is how no you country. got it you're good yep, there we go um uh, what does that statue look like? Well, you can see all of that by subscribing to us on YouTube, the YouTube version, Crimson Cowell Comic Club, over on YouTube for the full experience. Uh, Kirby has a spinoff podcast called Under the Call of MS. Is there anything you want to promote for things that have come out or things that are coming out soon? Yeah, lots more of your comic reviews up. We got started our previews on there now also, so you get some more preview stuff if you need it and some more unpackings and uh i'm hoping that by the time this comes out i might have the first reading of a comic out by then so i'm hoping within the next week or so so we'll see what happens cool 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 so yeah subscribe to uh under the call of a mess wherever you get your podcast as well as instagram and youtube and check that out i have some art accounts over on uh, instagram and facebook under my name anthony latch l-a-a-t-s-c-h i just uh posted a bunch of uh, ghostbusters related stuff mostly the stay puff marshmallow man in in uh workout poses and i called it the stay buff marshmallow man so there's a lot of stay buff marshmallow men out there I posted a Slimer. I got another Ghostbuster, maybe two other Ghostbuster things to post. A um, lot of fun stuff. And then uh, I got to post those Adams Family yet. I just have to, well, we have Kong and Godzilla coming up. So I got some stuff to post there. So 
I basically saying I have uh, art, new art every single day that I post on those accounts. I also host uh, Cartoonist by Night over on YouTube, a uh, drawing show with my friends Troy Dungara, Matt Rogers, Matt Fife, and uh, frequent guest D. Brad Gibson, Cartoonist by Night. Um, we dropped a brand new episode with one of our big heavy hitters from All Yak Comics because we've been kind of going through the All Yak Comics um, uh, roster, the bullpen, if you will. And uh, Scoop McMahon, that episode is up there for people to watch. Scoop McMahon, you know him from All oh Yak Comics, just because I have all this stuff here from our recording. I'm just going to show it off. All oh Yak Comics, his own thing called The Super Kings as well as The Adventures of Cthulhu Jr. and Friends, as well as his own creation of Sammy the Samurai Squirrel, as well as Agents of Slam, stuff that I've talked about on this show. Uh, he contributed to Dead Man Tells the Spooky Tales, as well as Spot on Adventure, as well as Wrapped Up, and of course... His variant cover for issue number three of Happy Astronaut, full on wrestling style. So Scoop McMahon, that was an awesome hang. Uh, we gave him the choice of topic, and he picked Batman the Animated Series, which is an awesome topic Topic that we all enjoyed and have fun drawing characters related to talking about Batman the Animated Series and learning about Scoop McMahon. So check that out by subscribing to Cartoonist by Night over on YouTube. Okay, that is going to do it for this episode thank you for watching thank you for listening tell a friend if you enjoy the show tell a friend if you don't enjoy the show just tell a friend so check that out that is going to do it for this episode um this whole time i've been afraid of no ghost i've been using kung fu telekinesis and i've been hungry for second breakfast <laughs> to be continued